looking at monitoring systems as inputs for counterfactual impact evaluation. We'll be focusing on the data quality. Um, we'll be looking at how we can leverage uh, technology, as I said, um, and then uh, focusing on the ethical considerations um, with a particular focus on data security and data protection. Okay, so we jump straight into um, session five. So data quality, um, data collection methodology. So what do we mean by methodology? We mean the actual, uh, the rules and processes that we go through when we actually are in the field to collect the data um, for our studies. Um, so it's a very systematic process. So you wanna have a very clear uh, understanding of what your methodology will be before you even go out to field. The learning objectives for the session is that participants will be able to describe the concept of non-response errors, and non-response error is quite a big uh, concern um, when you're collecting data um, and how it can impact um, any analysis that you do on that data afterwards. We'll learn approaches that we can use to minimize non-response error, um, particularly in hard to reach areas. Um, and we'll be able to, able to explain how effective fieldwork protocols can enhance data quality. Just a quick recap from day one. So as I said previously, day one was very much focused on setting up um, your strategy for the data collection in terms of the indicators that you want to use. So using your program theory of change, um, an evaluation question to develop a list of indicators that you want to measure and how you can actually try and collect data that will um, provide these indicators, such as in writing individual questions. Um, we talked about how we can use existing tools, particularly um, how they can be particularly useful when trying to capture data that could be used for an indicator, or if that's not possible, um, how you can write the best questions possible. And then um, we looked at how we could obtain a sampling frame that contains units of the population of interest. Um, so again, if we're interested in refugees in northern Uganda, we want to try and obtain a list of um, of that population um, that we can then sample from. Um, so then that the final step was calculating the required sample size um, and how we can use random sampling to select respondents in a non-biased manner. Um, so in terms of when you're collecting data, when you're actually in the field, once you've sent uh, teams out or you're monitoring staff out, um, the two uh, main things that we're concerned about. So the first one here uh, is measurement error. So if anyone remembers that from yesterday, um, does anyone does anyone remember uh, or recall or want to explain what we mean by measurement error? Um, we will go through it again very briefly. Um, but if anyone um, does want to um, give input on what that what they think is me measurement error, I open the floor. OK, so I think uh, people are a bit shy. So um, the uh, the measurement error is basically the difference between the value that we collect in the field and the true value of that. So if I'm interested in income, the obviously people have a true income over maybe, let's say, the last the last six months. There is a real value of the amount of money that they received, either as salary or in kind payments. There is a real value for that. But when we actually send people to the field to interview them in their household or telephone them to ask them uh, about jobs that they've done, they may not be able to provide a precise error for that, uh, a precise number for that. So the error is the difference between what we collect and the true value. Um, and again, as we discussed yesterday, that can come from various different um, risks. It can come from um, cognitive challenges. Um, it might be that it might be very hard for people uh, to add up all of the jobs that they've done in the last six months. Um, it might be hard for them to give an exact number of the their weekly wage. 
Um, it might be a recall issue. It might be something that we're asking them, something that they did maybe six months ago or a year ago in some cases. Um, it can be very hard for people to recall that. And generally, the longer the recall period, so the longer the gap between the event happening and us as data collectors collecting that data, the higher risk there is of measurement error. Um, and then finally, something we'll touch on a little bit today again, um, social desirability bias. Um, that often occurs when you ask sensitive questions. Um, so people may feel compelled to respond in a way that's not necessarily truthful. It may not be that they're necessarily uh, um, purposely deceiving you or want to deceive you, but it might be that they just feel embarrassed or that they want to not look bad in front of the um, interviewer. Um, so they may change their response and not necessarily give a truthful response based on um, uh, based on the fact that the question um, has social cues tied to it. Um, so that's measurement error. We talked a little bit about how we could use um, quite uh, crude tools such as a diary. Um, so there was the example in Uganda where farmers were provided um, with a diary where they could um, keep track of the inputs and the yield over um, a, a harvest season. And then we saw that uh, that actually gave a much more accurate picture than just simply sending teams to uh, interview people at the end of the season and ask them to calculate their total yield of their crops, for example. So there are crude ways of um, trying to overcome measurement error. There are some more technologically advanced ones using technology that we'll talk a little bit about today. So that's measurement error. What we're going to focus on a little bit more today is uh, non-response error. OK, so. Non-response error. Um, non-response error is the failure to obtain intended information from respondents. OK, so what are typical reasons for non-response? It might be attrition. What do we mean by attrition? This is when we lose participants in a study um, over time. So it might be that they have moved away and they've changed their telephone number, so survey teams can't find them. This is a very typical problem with mobile populations, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and um, it will be part of the breakout session to discuss ways that we can overcome that. Um, it might be that the uh, respondent is actually no longer of interest to the study. Um, an example of this may be if you're doing an education program and you're interested in interviewing teachers. If a teacher is no longer part of the teaching profession, if they've left, maybe they've got another job, um, then they're no longer actually interest um, for the teacher training program um, because the information they can provide is not is not relevant to the outcomes that we're interested in. You know, classroom atten attainment, teaching methods, um, etc. So that's one really big cause of non-response. Um, another is refusals. OK, so this occurs in every single um, survey you will do. If anything, I would be very worried if there wasn't any refusals um, because um, quite simply, just sometimes people do not want to take part in a survey, even if they've taken part in it in the past or even if they've taken part in the programme. Um, there's nothing that anyone can do to compel people um, to take part in the study. And that will be something that we talk about when we um, focus on ethical um, approaches to take collecting data. Um, and then another reason for non-response is pure poor questionnaire design. Um, this is a little bit more focused on um, non-response in terms of individual questions. I won't go too much into detail in that now because we'll talk about it a little bit later. So that's those are three real common areas of non-response. And non-response leads us to lose data effectively because we can no longer collect data of interest from these people. So when we talked yesterday about the sample size that was required, you can obviously see that if we know that we need um, 2000 uh, participants um, for a study for it to be credible, for us to be able to go 
uh, to policy makers, to other researchers and say that this impact evaluation is credible and it clearly shows that this program is working or this program is not working. Um, if we have large non-response and we can't get to that required threshold um, of sample size, then obviously non-response has a big impact um, on the credibility of a study. So that's just in terms of pure uh, the loss of sample size, but it also means it also has a big risk for us in how um, it may lead to bias as well. OK, so. It's not just a case that we're losing people for a study. It may be that particular types of people in the study are leaving. Um, and that can that can obviously affect um, any analysis that we do, because if, for example, we find that um, refugees are much more likely to be uh, non response, so maybe they've returned back to their um, home country or maybe they are much more mobile because they don't have these family roots or maybe they're just looking for anywhere they can work. Um, and maybe they uh, yeah, they they don't have such clear um, social networks that you can try and track them with. If we start seeing that refugees are leaving the study, then that obviously means that our study um, firstly is is biased on the overall level because maybe refugees on average um, have um, slightly lower levels of income um, or have slightly lower level, like much lower levels of social cohesion. If we then lose these participants, then we're going to start seeing much uh, potentially higher levels of um, social cohesion or income because the people that remained in the study had much better outcomes for this. So that's one one area where it causes problems. And the other area is that when we try and do subgroup analysis. So again, we talked about it yesterday that if we we're not just interested in how our um, social savings and social loans program affects pe the overall people uh, population in an area. Maybe we're, we want to find the specific impact on both the host community and on refugees um, because we see these are very different people, uh, types of people, and we're very interested in the differential effects on it. Um, then, then that obviously affects our ability to make um, inferences and conclusions from our study on the refugee population. So as you can see, it's a very big issue um, for a study non-response, both because it reduces the sample size and the credibility of the study, but it also means that um, it may lead to biased data if the attrition or non-response is non-random. So it's not just by chance, you know, you don't just happen to lose ran people randomly because, um, you know, they couldn't answer the door, they were out for work or something. Um, it's just that it's actually specifically tied to something. Actually, I, I use the example of you of going to missing people at work. Actually, that might be a, a, a non-random thing in itself. And we'll talk a little bit about that, um, because obviously if people are working, then they are maybe very different to people um, who are unemployed or available at the household at all times. So we, we, we're concerned when the, the, the attrition is non-random. Okay, so um, the first, we, we talked a little bit about this, but I'll go over it again. The first type of non-response is what we refer to as unit non-response. So this is when a certain sample unit is missing. What we mean by a sample unit is um, a participant in a study. It might be an individual, it might be a household, it might be a firm, um, but it's the entire unit is uh, missing in the data. So this might be because ref respondents are um, refusing to take part. Um, respondents are not available for interview, or it might be that respondents have moved away. So this is when we actually lose an entire unit in our in our study. So one typical reason for non-response may be due to unavailability at the time of the interview. So this is often common um, when we um, consider that 
people are often at work. Uh, I touched upon it um, previously, um, particularly agricultural workers um, who are often working at the plots during the day. So pre some key practical remedies to this, and there is no simple and easy way to avoid this, um, but there are certain things that you can prepare for um, before um, a data collection to try and minimize this. The first thing really before anything is when you're doing, um, when you're preparing, when you're workshopping the tool, um, when you're doing pre-testing. So remember pre-testing is when you go out to um, test your tool in a sim with people that would be similar to those responding to the survey. Um, you may want to speak to them uh, after the after the tool and speak to them, you know, people that are typically doing your type of job, you know, when are you typically out to field? When are you um, available? When is typically the best time to speak to you? It might be that you contact um, local village contacts that you have um, to try and understand the context a little bit more. And you can build this into the training um, so that enumerators are uh, aware of it beforehand. But one thing that you can do um, practically is, if possible, if you have contact details. So this really comes back to how good your um, sampling frame is. Sometimes you will not have a sampling frame at all and you have to go out to the field and uh, do a random walk, for example. However, if you're, um, if for example, as uh, for example, the Uganda EUTF, um, they received application uh, forms from um, applicants for the study, and then they were randomly assigned to take part in the study or not. Um, the, you can use the application forms to have contact details um, for uh, the participants of the study. So this might be phone numbers of the individual, it might be phone numbers um, for their parents, it might be a, another an alternative contact number. This is something you should also be thinking when you are designing um, a survey. Always be thinking the next the next wave. Um, always be thinking how many things can I collect um, that can help my job easier to be easier in the next phase. Because if you have the contact details before you actually go to field, um, you could actually set up a phone um, a phone call center. So, or you can provide the phone the phone numbers to the supervisors who prior to the actual team being in the field could phone up the respondents and start to make appointments for them. So then you can learn a little bit when people might be available and they might not be available. So this can start to avoid this kind of just chance uh, going up to a household and hoping that they're in um, if you can do it ahead of time. That's not always going to be possible. Sometimes it might not even be desirable. I think sometimes you want to speak to um, people with experience in those areas and understanding if if you reach out to these people, um, is there any chance that you could make them less likely to take part in the study? Are they going to be thinking, oh, no, these people again, uh, I'll just tell them I'm not available. Um, so I think it's important to speak to people who understand it test it, pre-test it, maybe to select um, 10, 10 respondents to call them prior to the field, see how they respond. And if you're getting a lot of people saying, uh, no, I'm too busy, don't, I don't want to take part, then maybe yeah, readjust and don't, um, don't take this approach. I think it's really important to always test things before and just to take a small, maybe just five or 10 um, cases and just test them before because um, it's much cheaper and it's much easier to learn these things before hiring 20 enumerators um, and learning them. I think another key thing is to not overly burden uh, the staff that you're working with, with daily targets. Um, they need to have some level of flexibility during the day. Um, from my experience, quite often, um, interviewers and numerators um, will be very diligent if you hire good ones. Um, they will go up to a household, they will speak to, if, they, if their target is not in, they will speak to neighbours 
they will speak to uh, any local leaders, they will speak to their family if they if they get told, oh, this person's family uh, lives nearby in this household, and maybe the family can contact um, the respondent. And maybe the respondent is is at work, but then you they can arrange for an interview to take uh, to take place a bit later in the day um, when the person is available. Um, or it might be that there are particular times such as weekends where people have greater availability. So maybe instead of having the rest days of Sunday, um, maybe you have it on Monday. Um, so then that allows the uh, enumerators to work over the weekend when people have better availability. The next thing is clear logging of interview attempts um, with notes from the enumerator. This is something that should always be uh, really stressed to the staff because um, it, it benefits everyone. It um, both in terms of it provides you, uh, the person managing this or uh, the person reviewing the data collection with clear examples of the efforts that have been made by the interviewers. And it also protects uh, the enumerators because they can show, show they're working. A good way of doing this is to actually, um, yeah, ask, their, ask interviewers to take a GPS coordinate when they visit a household, for example. Um, so they can clearly show, I visited this household two times during the day. And sometimes enumerators need to work a little bit as uh, detectives in terms of going from neighbours, other household members, um, finding people um, that may also have the required knowledge um, of where A, where the person is, or B, maybe the other, if it's not so important who the target is, then uh, maybe they can also um, take part in the study, but we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. Um, so one thing to deal, uh, one thing to you have to create um, to deal with non-response because you want to avoid it, you want to avoid this non-response as much as possible, is to develop clear revisit protocols. Um, a key word here is protocols. Um, so this is something that um, is very, very important when you're doing data collection. What we mean by protocols is effectively a set of rules um, or a set of guidelines, a set of processes that people working on the data collection need to follow and should be knowledgeable about. Um, so for example, with this, revisit protocols need to be developed these rules of when do we visit when do we revisit a household how many times do we revisit it do we tell enumerators that they need to visit a household three times before they consider it to be non-response um how do they go about actually um collecting tracking data um for the target respondent, so they gather information from household members or neighbours. How do they input this? It might be that you have within, if you're using a paper questionnaire, you might have a page where they can write notes on um, information that they gather um, from other household members or neighbours or family members um, that can then be stored um, or perhaps given to another member of staff uh, a couple of weeks later if we want to try and give this person another go. Um, the contact numbers attempted, I think this is really, really important that they, they log if they have telephone numbers, they log um, how many contact, uh, which contact numbers they should contact first and what they should do in each case, whether it's um, busy, whether it's invalid, if it's invalid, like it it no longer exists or if it's a wrong number then we in our records we can remove that contact number to make any future tracking more efficient um, and then finally it might be that you want to have clear rules on the spread of the visits during a day um, so it might be that you say uh, this might be linked to the number of visits to a household the worst case scenario is saying to people you need to visit a household three times and they go at 9am, 9 9.30, 9 
and then 10 a.m. Um, because that really does minimize the chances of actually um, of actually getting hold of this person um, because if they are in the field in the morning then you're going to miss them whether if you go at 9 9 30 or 10 a.m um so you want to try and make sure that the spread of visits are done throughout the day so you might tell enumerators that you want one done in the morning and one and done in the afternoon or in the evening um and you may build it within your um, data collection tool to take timestamps and gps um, whenever they make a visit so that's a way that you can track and you can see whether these revisit protocols are actually being followed by by your staff. We talked about the non response due to refusals. Um, how can we try and avoid this? Um, this is actually a relatively more straightforward um, straightforward one in terms of um, in in uh, in typical contexts where you're not necessarily using um, going to uh, high risk um, areas for refusal, such as like hidden populations. Um, often with refusals, the main cause is that um, they don't have the full understanding or they don't have the clear knowledge. Um, we talk, we'll talk about informed consent a little bit later, um, but typically in my experience, when people refuse to take part in the study, it's because um, they haven't been fully, um, it hasn't been fully explained to them, you know, why, why, why has this person come to my household? Or why has he been asking my neighbours for me? Um, who, yeah, who is this person? Um, so it's really, really important that you firstly have well-trained enumerators um, and you develop a clear introductory script or informed, well, not in or, you also have an informed consent note. And I think it's really important to role play these, both in terms of getting the enumerators experienced with introducing a study. Um, so if I come to your household, I firstly say my name, I show, I say the organization that I've been working for, I show my ID card, um, I explain that I've spoken to uh, the village head, um, and then I start to explain the study itself and I start to go through the informed consent note. Um, and it's really important that this is understood by the enumerators. And although we ask, would ask them to go through a script, um, the script, they should be reading it naturally. They shouldn't just be reading it from a piece of paper. And um, the idea is that they want to be building rapport with people. So that's why I think whenever you're doing training for a data collection, role plays of introducing the study is, is really, really important and uh, definitely should not be sort of overlooked if there's time constraints. Um, because it's a really good way of um, reducing non-response due to refusals. So that's that's a typical case where you know you're just going to a household, um, and you know there's no reason for them necessarily to um, be um, skeptical of you. But often with hard-to-reach areas, um, there is a greater risk of refusal. Um, so it might be that they're wary of providing information when they're wishing to remain hidden. Um, if you have, if you are a refugee in a country and you've escaped um, conflict, um, you may not necessarily want to be telling people uh, your name, your contact details, your parents phone number, uh, your educational background. Um, it might be that people are just um, very wary of um, giving this information out, this data, this sometimes sensitive data. So there is always a greater risk of refusal. It might be that they're reluctant to sign any consent note. Um, I think quite often with that is that uh, it might be a language issue as well, um, because um, if unless you have um, enumerators that can 
uh, communicate effectively in their, uh, their, the language they're fluent in, they may be reluctant to sign something that they don't fully understand, um, such as a consent note. And there's also the insider outsider issue in the sense that um, they, if, if people are coming into a community um, and they are not from a similar background, they may be naturally skeptical or have a lack of trust of outsiders. So what can we try and do um, to try and minimize this non-response? Um, I think we'll talk, we'll, there'll be a great discussion for this in the breakout session, um, but a couple of ideas now is that um, we can use oral consent, okay? So this would need to be confirmed with the IRB, um, but it might be that, yeah, we just we, we just mentioned that people might be unwilling to sign documents. They may be unwilling yeah, to have uh, then their their signature attached to a form that they you know don't fully understand or um, they just don't want to sign anything full stop because they don't want that uh, potentially their signature on file or whatever. Um, so one approach is that you can use all consent. So you can actually just um, ask the person do you wish to take part in the study, yes or no? And then based on their response, um, you can then, for example, capture that within your, um, your data collection tool. This would need to be confirmed with the IRB um, that you're um, getting ethical clearance from, um, because often the sort of the default would be that you would have a written um, consent um, from the respondent. Um, but if you can discuss with the IRB and you can discuss that, this is the reason why we're going with oral consent um, because we want to minimize attrition potentially from uh, not attrition minimize refusal um, from these areas because they may be skeptical or wary of signing documents um, then that might be an argument that the irb accepts the next thing is to understand the context and gain buy-in from local leaders um, and support from cultural insiders in the process. So as I said, there's often a wariness or a lack of trust um, for outsiders. Um, if you can discuss with local leaders, local organisations that are working there, um, if you can contact them beforehand, maybe you can learn a little bit more about it. Maybe you can um, have a local representative with your team that can speak to respondents um, and discuss any concerns that they may have, then this reduces this issue of the outsider lack of trust issue. Another thing that you can do is you can really try and hire enumerators from the targeted group. Um, so you, you may be, if you're interested in refugees from a particular background, then you may search for enumerators um, from a similar background. Um, this helps both in terms of culturally, but also in terms of uh, any potential language issues. Um, they may be able to speak to the respondent in a language that they're much more comfortable in. Non-response due to migration. Um, so if this study involves mobile populations, um, then it's at higher risk of attrition. Um, this is a very uh, typical problem with um, impact valuations, particularly ones that are spread over a long amount of time. Um, often you, the people that you are interviewing will no longer live in, this, in the uh, place that you previously interviewed them in. So unless you if, unless you know this beforehand, it's going to mean going to the village, for example, and then being told, oh no, Ellie, Ellie left for uh, a job uh, six months ago. Um, and then that obviously starts the tracking process. Um, this is the risk for this really depends on the population. Um, so this should be something that you should take into account beforehand. Um, so consider how mobile a population is um, and whether uh, and, and the risk of them moving. So you want to you want to collect good tracking data. 
So we mean by this, we mean multiple contact numbers. So as I said, when we were developing the application form for Uganda, we didn't just take the phone number of the individual participant. We asked for alternative contact numbers. We asked for parents phone numbers. Um, we also did this when we were doing the um, the follow up survey for the Gambia um, EUTF, the Techie Fee, where at the end of the interview, we actually had a sort of five minute uh, dedicated session on collecting as much information as we could. Um, on the respondent, taking down not just their numbers, uh, but yeah, other people's contact numbers, but also checking numbers that they've had before, saying, you know, do you still, is this number still yours? Do you still, is it still attached to you? Because one thing you want to avoid is that on the final end line, you end up having seven or eight numbers attached to each respondent and six of them don't work, and then it just becomes very inefficient. One thing that we're looking more into um, now is the use of social media apps such as WhatsApp, Telegram. Um, when we collect uh, telephone numbers, we um, we ask them, uh, do you use WhatsApp, Telegram or Signal with this number? And then that can help if you wanted to uh, regularly contact the person. Um, or you wanted to send out mass messages, instead of having to pay for SMS messages, um, you could send messages uh, free of charge by WhatsApp or Telegram. Um, similar to that, the social media groups, I think actually, you know, we're, we're moving on from kind of like Facebook and things like that to Telegram groups or WhatsApp groups. Um, and it, you can actually try and like attach this to the project that you're working on. So maybe if it's a vocational training program, uh, maybe participants have uh, developed, have, have created a WhatsApp group um, that they're part of. Um, these sort of things can be useful to know um, and to understand and to leverage as a way that you can try and um, trace uh, respondents over time. Obviously, that only really works for treatment cases um, for comparison groups and people that did not receive the program, then um, that's un unlikely to help. And you want to try and avoid case, uh, too much attrition in the in the comparison group. Um, but it's never it's never a bad idea to improve um, where you can, even if it's just for the, the treatment. So that's non response due to migration. Um, so really with that, it's it's a case of can you collect as much good tracking data that can help you um, help you find this person potentially a year down the line. You may want to do regular check ins with the respondent um, just to ensure that the phone uh, information is up to date, but this obviously um, can require resources and you also want to consider that you don't want to you don't want to annoy people. You don't want to give them fatigue. You don't want to be constantly checking in with people, asking them, um, they may feel a little bit spooked that somebody's somebody's just messaging them out of the blue to ask them if this is still X, Y or Z. So you need to, if you want to take this approach, you really need to think about it and discuss um, and understand the context a little bit about what the best approach is. Um, the final thing is incentives. Um, this is not necessarily attached to migration, um, but the use of if you do uh, use incentives, and I think this is something we'll talk incentives is something we can talk a bit about in the ethical section. Um, it's not always appropriate to give incentives. It's not always desirable to give incentives. Um, but for example, if you are doing a phone survey, um, if you provide them with mobile money credit, um, then that may, makes it uh, much more likely that they're going to respond to your um, your study six months down the line, a year down the line, because they they remember, ah, oh, you know, I, these guys gave me uh, this, so I'm happy to uh, to respond to them again. It's worth my time um, to uh, answer their questions. So I guess um, just a quick sort of open floor. 
Um, can people think of any other ways that we can reduce non-response due to uh, people migrating from the study and being no longer traceable? Um, has anyone had this experience before and uh, approaches they developed to overcome it? Um, I open the floor, if not, uh, or if not, if people don't want to open, um, discuss it in front of the whole group, um, you can discuss it in the breakout room shortly. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll give a t 20 seconds if anyone wants to um, raise any of their experiences. Yeah, please do go ahead, Modi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning to you all. Yes, uh, in also our experiences, sometimes we would use um, um, people from the same program who have done the same program to be able to reach to others that we couldn't reach. For example, if there are uh, people who have done a skill training program in a particular institution, if we are able to reach one or two, we are able to use this to be able to connect to the orders that we couldn't reach. And these are sometimes proven effective to be able to trace the orders. Because sometimes they may change their numbers mm -hmm. uh, due to uh, maybe they have lost their, their phone and they decided to have a, a new number altogether. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good approach to uh, leverage people um, that have also been part of the training. I mean, part of, for example, with the Uganda project, part of the idea is that um, improving um, integration, um, people working with people from other backgrounds um, and actually developing like a personal um, personal relationship with them. Just um, out of curiosity, how did you actually uh, do that? Did you did you give them a list of names of people that you're looking for and they let you know if they uh, were still in contact with somebody. Um, how how did you how did do you do you recall how you actually like practically um, did that? Yes, yeah, because um, when the enumerators couldn't find these people, we tried to see who were the um, I would say some of the participants that they did some of the programs together. So through that, we are able to say, OK, they did the program with uh, this, that and that. And then uh, some of those, those we are able to get and then we say, OK, do you have an idea who, where this guy is or where his, what his contact number is? So sometimes we are able to trace some of them uh, to, to those contacts. But sometimes they are usually in contact once they have done six months uh mm -hmm. three months program together and sometimes they form whatsapp groups and through this we are able to reach some of them yeah i think that that seems like a really sensible approach particularly if you know from your monitoring data potentially who was in a class or who was in the same institution as another person you might wait until the end of the first round of data collection you may have a list of all of your non-responses and you may look at um you may look at uh, the the class they were in, the institution they're in, the um, the course that they were studying, um, and you may you may um, randomly select uh, two or three people from each institution in each class, um, phone them up, and ask them if they were explain what you're doing, and ask them if they were still in contact with these people. It might be that you um, you speak to people and they're able to. I mean, almost doing a snowball approach where you you might ask, you know. Uh, who who do you think is the most uh, sort of networked person within this class? You know, you everyone knows those people in life that sort of um, just seems to uh, have connections and make these contacts and keep in touch with people. It might be that you use like a, a, a sort of a quasi snowball approach. Um, so thanks a lot. Is there, does anyone else have any um, experiences in in ways that they can avoid uh, or better track people that have moved away? Um, in studies or even for just monitoring purposes? Um, I have one. Um, yep. well, yes, we had a project where we we're supporting young girls to um, learn vocational training. And so we trained them and then later on the review was for them to be self-employed. Um, so during the, when we began, we did take their numbers and as well as like get to know their immediate family, like someone to call and stuff. So. 
when we went back for the tracer studies and we were told some of them had moved away. So we, we, we spoke to those that we had numbers of, the family members that we had numbers of. So then we asked them questions, okay, so what are they doing right now? And for some of them, if we couldn't reach them on phone, their, their families were able to respond whether they were actually using the training for work or they had started doing something else. And yeah, but that, that is also for like rural communities or tight knit communities where people know where other people are. <laughs> yeah, so using uh, the respondents kind of as a proxy um, for the data that you want to collect. Um, I, that, that brings with itself a lot of challenges about data quality. Um, but I think, yeah, as you said, if it's close knit communities and if it's just quite basic um, indicators that you're interested in, you know, do they have a job? Um, do they, um, where have they moved to? Have they migrated, for example? These sort of things, yeah, then you might be able to leverage um, other knowledgeable people um, if you can't contact the person themselves. Um, and I think what would be important is to obviously have this noted in the data. Um, if you were doing this sort of approach for an impact evaluation, this would have to be um, noted in the data and maybe it's um, counted as an approximation rather than, um, yeah, rather than a definite figure. But I think that's a really important thing to, uh, particularly to use in these communities, to use other people, um, family members, um, that may be knowledgeable about um, their, their, firstly, their, the person's whereabouts and secondly, what they're doing. So thanks a lot, Arifa. Um, I think maybe if, if there's one more person that wants to share their experiences, um, please feel free. Um, the floor is open. Um, otherwise, I think uh, otherwise we can move on. Um, I also have a, a typical example of such. Yeah. We at IOM in the Gambia, sometimes when the, 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 the district owners arrive, it's like um, they'll give uh, contact details of their relatives. So but sometimes within six months, they will maybe separate with their relatives. So sometimes it's difficult to reach them. So what we do sometimes, we just maybe contact the returnees they arrive with. So sometimes those guys will be able to help us at least trace them. So in certain instances, we use the migration information staffs because we have mixed centers within the regions mm -hmm. where you know staffs are employed there. So sometimes we use those mixed staffs, at least they will also help us track, uh, trace those uh, returnees wherever they are. So those are also two scenarios, uh, examples of maybe methodologies we use to trace, uh, trace these returnees. Yeah, so I think using the context and using um, program staff or administrative staff um, that might be attached to it um, given the context i think yeah that's a reasonable uh reasonable approach and it really is just this kind of it sometimes is a little bit of an art form of figuring out um who who is going to be net best knowledgeable about this person if we can't find them is it somebody that they arrived with for example in this case um so i think uh i think it's 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 really good to think before any data collection um these approaches um, to mitigate the risk of the non-response. Um, and as I said, I think it's quite clear that from, from this case, it really is almost a little bit of like, uh, from the experiences shared, it's a little bit of kind of detective work. Um, it might be that you ask other uh, classmates within it. It might be that you find uh, family members. It might be that you find administrative staff. Um, but yeah, just thinking, thinking, how, uh, who can help in this certain situation? Because um, as we said, we, we know that there is very big um, consequences to um, non-response. Um, so thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on just very briefly. I think then we'll, we'll have a breakout session very shortly. Um, yeah, so we've just discussed about the types of non-response we can have, how we can try and kind of overcome it. Um, another solution, um, it's not ideal. Um, we will talk a little bit about the issues with it, but one thing that you can do is you can replace people um, if, if it's appropriate in the context. Often um, with, for example, like RCTs, we might be using every single person that applied for the project in the sample, so we don't have any replacements. Um, so in this case, if there's no, if the sampling frame is basically the same number of respondents as the sample that we need, 
um, then we obviously do not have any replacements. But if our sampling frame has um, 5,000 uh, farmers and we select 2,000, then we actually potentially have 3,000 replacements. Um, so this this increases the sample size, so it deals with this problem of reduced sample size leading to lower credibility of the study um, because we can kind of top up. So using that example, if we have 300 farmers out of the 2000 that uh, are non response, if we use 300 of the replacement farmers, then our overall sample size then returns back to 2000. Um, so we, we can um, address that issue. However, one thing that's really, really important to consider um, is that um, if you replace cases um, too easily, then it's likely to increase the potential for attrition bias um, because it means that basically anyone that if, if you have, if you replace as soon as somebody is at work and is unavailable, then suddenly you're going to start having no people that are employed in your study. Um, so then you're going to just have unemployed people in your study that were available on the very first attempt. Um, and then that means that your study isn't representative of your um, of the population that you're interested in. And you might see lower impacts or higher impacts depending on it. Um, so whilst replacing people is a solution for bringing the sample size back up, it does um, increase the potential for bias. So we should be we should have careful replacement protocols in place prior to going to field. An example of this is how many visits do we need to make before we replace a household or an individual? Um, for example, we just we just talked about the extensive tracking um, efforts that go through. You know, we we talk to their classmates, we talk to their uh, family members, uh, we come back at a later date once we know where they are. Um, we want to make sure that we still do these tracking efforts that we don't just say, you know, we try once and then we replace. Um, so we want to have clear number of times that somebody should be visiting a household um, before um, before they get replaced. And uh, if the field team is informed of how they moved, this is a case of budget. Uh, budget issues. In an ideal world, we would just be able to trace, we would be able to track everyone across the country, no matter what. If we had unlimited money, we could send somebody, in theory, we could send somebody to another continent to interview a respondent. But, you know, we have to live in practical realities. Um, so it might be that if somebody has moved outside of a radius of X kilometres, 10 kilometres, for example, um, then we would replace. Um, I put the example of X kilometers. Um, it would be, it might be that you contextualize it to say into another ward or another district. If they say they move into another district, uh, then we don't. Or it might be that if the team has to travel for more than one hour to get there, then then they would be replaced. So field staff should have clear rules on how to do replacements. Um, so we want to avoid any potential biases. Um, so going back to the example of the um, the farmers, if we replace a farmer, um, then we look at our replacement list. Um, it shouldn't just be that the enumerator goes and chooses the next the nearest household um, to the person. It should be randomly selected. So what I would do as a practical example, and you could do it on something as straightforward as Excel. I would have this list of replacement farmers and I would randomly order them. And I would tell uh, interviewers that you have to start at the top and work your way down, that you can't just select, um, you can't just select uh, the most convenient household. So we've talked about um, unit non-response so that again that's when an entire uh, individual or a firm or whatever um, the unit of interest is in your study or um, project is and they no longer take part in uh, the interview um, we're now going to focus a little bit more on item non-response um, so item non-response is when information um, is required 
is um, information is missing basically from an interviewed respondent. Um, so an individual item, so maybe one question or it might be one unit, like uh, one module, maybe the uh, the education background module might be missing. Um, just to give you a little example, it might be somebody saying, what's your income? And then saying, I'm not going to answer that question. You know, I don't I don't want to tell you my income. Maybe you're going to tell the tax man. Um, so non response can occur when in respondents indicate that they either don't know or refuse to answer a question. Um, it may be that it's cognitively challenging. Um, so it might be that it is just too complicated and somebody says, oh, I don't know. I don't know what my how much fertilizer I used in uh, the rainy season, uh, the, the harvest season in, uh, yeah, in 2012 or <laughs> I mean, that's a very long example. But yeah, they, they may just they may just it might be too difficult for them to actually uh, come up with a clear answer for them. So they might just say, I don't know. Um, it a, a big risk of it comes from asking potentially um, sensitive questions. So we talked about this. Um, we, we touched on it a little bit yesterday. Um, when we talked about social desirability bias. So it might not be that they change their answer. It might be not that they say, you know, um, uh, no, I've never had sex with anyone other than my partner because they want, they feel socially that's what they should say. It may be that they actually just actively refuse to answer, answer the question. Um, and just at this point, I guess it's important to uh, stress again from the ethical side, both people are able to refuse to take part in your study and they are also available to, they, they're also um, able to uh, refuse to take part in an individual question. You know, you can't force somebody to give you a response. Tools to address item non response. Um, so it might be that for uh, income, you might effectively communicate that no, I'm not I'm not attached to the government in any way. Uh, I'm not involved in the tax authorities. Um, reiterate the confidentiality of responses. So remind them that no one, um, any data is going to be um, pseudo anonymized. So you're not going to see Nathan Sivright income 12,000. Um, you're going to see ID 1001 income um, 12,000. So reiterate the confidentiality of responses. You do this at the beginning of the survey when you do the informed consent. You may want to have a little section before you ask people about their income. You may just want to remind them um, of this. And a very kind of practical thing is actually privacy during an interview. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in an interview with people taking part in the survey and their neighbor is just sitting next to them or um, somebody is just walking by and they're in the middle of uh, an area where there are people around. If you're going to be asking people about income, then you obviously yeah, don't, want, don't want to be asking them in a, a public space or you might want to um, ask them um, if you can find a more private um, place to, to do this, uh, the survey. Other sensitive questions may require more sort of sophisticated tools. Um, so, for example, we have the randomized response technique. Um, so this is a this is actually something that has been used quite a lot, um, and I think it's a really interesting thing. Um, I can share links um, with the references if people are kind of interested in it. Um, but I think it's a really sensible, like an uh, innovative and simple approach to um, helping people answer uh, more truthfully um, in sensitive questions. So. It might be that uh, before being asked a sensitive question, you tell the respondents to roll a dice. And if the dice rolls on uh, lands on five or six, the respondent should answer it untruthfully. Um, and then you ask them the question. And then so actually, sorry, so at this point, the, in you, the person doing the survey does not know if it landed on the five or six. So the person doing the survey has no idea if they actually are telling the truth or not. But because we know the probability of answering truthfully and untruthfully, we can actually give a pretty good uh, estimate of um, the incidence of um, these sensitive uh, topics. Um, so 
as I said, it does not reveal to the interviewer what the respondent answered, so they don't know if the respondent is answering truthfully or untruthfully. This can help reduce social desirability bias and induce higher responsibility uh, response rates. This type of technique has been used quite a lot um, in um, development and in various different contexts. Um, a really good example of this was when they were trying to understand the prevalence of civil cooperation with militant groups in Nigeria. Um, so whether somebody was involved in cooperating with militant groups, this was a way that people could um, encourage people to answer truthfully. Um, so yeah, as I said, I, I can share, I, I, I won't go into too much detail on it, but I can share any sort of references if people are interested in this. Um, a more kind of uh, sophisticated way of doing it requires a little bit more budget and um, planning is to uh, provide respondents with the tool and ask them to complete these sensitive modules themselves. OK, so um, one particularly useful way of doing this is um, for audio. Um, you can basically give the respondent the tablet. You can tell them to put the earphones in and the earphones will then read out the questions and then they just enter their response on the keyboard or screen. OK, and it might be that um, it might be that the enumerator at the beginning sh explains this very clearly and shows them that once they swipe from um, this question, then that question is stored. I think actually in, in some CAPIs you can you can create it so that um, so in some of computer assisted um, personal interviewing software, you can even program it so that you, the enumerator actually can't even go back. So they can't go and see what the person entered, that that information that they entered is stored. Um, a really, I, I quite like this because it uh, avoids uh, issues relating to education and literacy, that if you just asked people to read um, the questions, they may not have a good enough grasp of language or they may not understand, you know, uh, what to do on a tablet, for example, um, whereas if you can give them audio instructions, um, then that uh, avoids um, this issue relating to education and literacy. Um, a review of this, so it has been tested um, in various, various contexts, and a review of it found that it was more likely to capture socially undesirable responses. So that's a very um, it's a good way of avoiding um, this uh, non-response due to sensitive questions is to actually think um, is to try and incorporate self-administered questions within, to, within your survey. OK, so um, welcome to the session. Um, so we have spent some time um, going over issues related to data quality. And I think Nathan has spent quite um, a bit of time um, explaining to us what um, data quality involves with regards to with regards to collecting data from the field. Um, and so I guess we would move on to the next session, which is leveraging technology for high data quality, leveraging technology from high data quality um, for for counterfactual impact evaluations. Yes, so I guess the objectives for this um, this particular session would be to look at the different methods that are available to us with regards to technology which have come up over the past few years, which can actually help us um, collect very high quality data for both um, counterfactual impact evaluations and monitoring systems. We will also spend some time to probably look at the different um, benefits that come with each of these tools, um, and then also look at some of the challenges that you could face when you use these approaches. Um, regardless of how advanced technology is, they always do come with some sort of challenges, which um, we would have to find ways to, to go around it. So we'll spend some time to look at them. Um, one, one particular area we would probably spend time looking at would be how to um, use telephone interviews in particular for 
data collection in hard to reach areas. I believe that the focus of this training workshop has been on how to collect data from hard to reach areas. And so we'll spend some time looking at telephone interviews and how these could actually be um, would be useful for us when we are collecting data in hard to reach areas. One other technology we would spend some time to look at is using GIS in the collection of data. Um, and there are different ways that GIS could be used. And so we'll look at how GIS is used both in preparation for data collection and then also to assess the quality of data that we collect from the field. So over the years, we've had different ways of collecting data, but in, in essence, we have we have like you know this, the, the traditional way of collecting data, which has always been collecting data using um, paper-based personal interviewing tools. And these the paper-based tool basically refers to questionnaires that have been printed out on a sheet of paper or different sheets of paper put together and administered. This could be either self-administered by the enumerator or administered by um, self-administered by the, 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 the person who is being interviewed. Um, this has been the traditional way that um, interviews or surveys have been done. Over the years, with the introduction of computers and other technologies, we've had the use of um, um, computer-based uh, personal interviewing, which basically people have given the name CAPI, um, computer-assisted personal interviews. Um, However, that has also been um, developed further, where we now have the computer-based telephone interview, which is based on leveraging on what you have on CAPI to conduct telephone interviews. Um, now, these, these three main data collection strategies or methods are what we would probably spend some time today on, um, looking at what kind of advantages they would present us with, and then what challenges that they, 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 they could they could um, present to us. So we've we've planned our data collection. We've um, we've 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 decided on on the tool that we are going to use. We've tried to think about all the possible ways that we could reduce non-response. One of the key questions that would come up then would be exactly how do we collect the data? Now this decision is very important because your decision is going to also influence the quality of data. With regards to all the issues with um, non-response, one of the ways you can compensate for it is to make a good decision in terms of what tool you use to collect the data. And that is why you would have to think through this, this, this process also in order for you to come up with a very good strategy that would suit your particular data collection whether to use a paper form, whether to use a copy tool, or whether to use um, a CATI tool. And we would spend some time to look at the different advantages that both of all of these strategies present to you. Let's start with paper tools. In general, paper tools refer to questionnaires that have been um, printed onto, onto papers or sheets of papers. And we hand these over to enumerators who go out to the field. And as I mentioned earlier on, either they administer this to the respondents or the respondents take these questionnaires and answer them and later on submit them to either the enumerators or to the researcher or whoever is the researcher or whoever is collecting the data. Now this has been used over the years. Um, and I think the one of the biggest advantages of using a paper questionnaire has always been that anyone can actually use this tool or can design these tools. Once you're a researcher and you know your research objectives and you've decided on what questions you're going to ask, it is always easy as a researcher to jump onto designing these um, questionnaires because all you would have to do is to print it out on a paper. And so anyone can do it. You do not need any programming skills for which you would realize in for um, computer assisted tools that you would need um, some level of programming skills to be able to design such questionnaires. Secondly, you don't need any technical equipment to actually 
produce any paper tools. The only equipment you might need is a computer and a printer. Um, these are enough for you to actually design your paper tool or collect your data also. So once you have your computer and your printer, you just print it out and then you go out and collect the data. Also, it does not really require any technical skills to administer. Once you hand over the questionnaire to the enumerators, all they have to do is ask the respondents the questions by reading it out from the paper, and then they just take in the answers or write in the responses that the, 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 the interviewees are actually providing. And this can be done by anyone without any technical skill. And also, one, one advantage of um, the paper tools is that you, at the end of the research, you have physical copies, which you can actually keep for quite a long time. Um, and with this, you don't have any threats with data loss. When you're using computers, there's always a challenge or there's always a risk of your hard disk crashing or some other technological, um, some technological mishappening that could actually cause you to lose data. Now, this does not happen with paper forms. And this, I, I believe this is something that we are all very much aware of. However, there are some challenges with that come with using the paper tools. Now, the paper tools have been, um, they are always prone to human error. Now, most of these errors follow from questionnaire routing. And questionnaire routing basically refers to how questions are routed based on responses that um, respondents give. Let's say that you are interviewing um, respondents about their jobs that they've had. And one of the questions would be whether they are self-employed or whether they are employees. Um, now, one of the questions that you would want to ask people who are employees would be very would be a bit different from what you would want to ask people who are employers. So, for example, you could have a routing problem if someone said they are employees. However, the follow-up questions that come are asking them for their um, for their profit and for their income. However, you would realize that profit and income relate more to people who are self-employed or people who have businesses who have monies coming in or sales. They make sales and then they make profits out of these. Um, what happens is that with paper tools, it's not very easy for you to make these routings possible because if the enumerator chooses the wrong routing, it could be a problem. And so that's one of the problems that paper tools presents for you. Um, with paper tools also, um, what happens is that once data is collected, physical copies of the forms need to get to the researcher before this data can actually be entered. And usually what happens is that the data is collected throughout the whole research period, and then data would be entered at the end of the research. Now the risk with this or the challenge with this is that if there's any problem that comes up during data collection, you are unable to make corrections. You're unable to uh, make adjustments to the tool. You will only realize errors in the questionnaire or any errors in the data once data collection is over. And this can be a very serious challenge in terms of the quality of the data that you collect for your impact evaluation or your monitoring data also. Another challenge is that for paper forms, you need quite a lot of money. Um, the budgetary demands are quite high because you would have to budget to print and paper is expensive. The cost of toners are also expensive. And so printing out a questionnaire for a household survey, which has, let's say over 500 households, would be pretty much very expensive. And the additional cost also comes from having to pay for data entry to be done. These, these, these costs are not, are not um, costs that you, you should take lightly. And that's why paper forms could be a problem for you when you decide to use them. Also, what happens with you know, having physical copies? In as much as it is a good thing to have physical copies of the questionnaire, they then pose a data protection challenge for you because you have physical copies of questionnaires that are with you, and unless you're keeping them in a safe or you are keeping them in a place which is um, locked up with keys, um, it is always going to be risky that someone could have access to, this, to these physical copies. Once someone has access to these physical copies, 
you could be in, in serious trouble because people's information is going to leak out. Another challenge could be also that the physical copies could get lost or damaged. Now, once this happens, you have you most likely would lose the data. If it happens that you lose the paper forms before data is even entered, then it means that you have lost the data totally and you probably not be able to retrieve it until you go back to the field to collect the data. However, if you're able to back it up on the computer or you're able to enter the data, that might be good. But then again, if it's lost, then it's possible that it might have landed somewhere else with someone. And um, this could be a very big challenge. And so using the paper tools can be very simple. It can be very advantageous. Um, it might save you money in one aspect, but in another aspect, you would incur quite a lot of heavy costs. And, and, and this can be very much of a problem for, for you when you're collecting data and the quality of data that you're going to get could be very, very low. Now going to the other side, which is the electronic tools. One of the biggest advantages of electronic tools, and there are quite a number of electronic tools, we'll go over some of them. Um, but basically we are talking about any tool or any questionnaire that has been programmed or that is administered using any electronic device. Now, the biggest advantage for electronic tools is that electronic tools help you or they provide you with real-time data such that you are able to monitor the data as and when they come in. The quality of the data for you is guaranteed because you can make checks as and when the data is coming. You don't need to wait until the data collection is over. You can program quite a lot of um, monitoring checks into the tool, or you can program the monitoring checks onto your data analysis software such that the moment you get the data in real time, you can actually monitor what is going wrong with the data collection, and then you can make changes to it. Another advantage is that um, with electronic tools, you are able to automate um, the routing. As I mentioned earlier on, when you have a paper form and you have a question that should be asked to a specific subcategory of people, and then there is another set of questions that should be asked to another category of people. When you have it on a paper form, this is not automatic. The enumerator has to choose this by him or herself. However, with an electronic tool, this is done automatically. And with that, it presents you with the, 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 the situation that you know that this, since it's automated, there's not going to be any error in this. And that's one of the biggest advantages for using electronic tools. Also, you are able to do real-time consistency checks on the data. So when people enter data using like electronic tools, you are able to calculate in real time and be able to tell if certain data that is being provided is wrong. For example, one thing we did in one of our surveys was to put in um, the age and the date of birth. You ask people for their age and then you ask for their birth date and then you realize there is an inconsistency. Um, this is this could be a check for you to be sure whether enumerators are asking the right questions or whether you are being provided the right responses. One thing is that sometimes with date of birth, for example, there are variations. However, if the variation is quite huge, if someone was born on a particular date and then they tell you their age and it's probably five, six years difference, then you know that there might be a problem and this has to be rechecked. And that is what electronic tools are able to do for you in real time. You don't have to do these calculations by hand. The computer does it for you and provides you with flags to check data inconsistencies. Another biggest advantage is that the data can be passworded, protected or encrypted, and we'll, we'll look at that in, um, in a later session today as to data protection and data encryption. So these are some of the advantages um, electronic tools can provide you. There are some disadvantages which, which, which refer to having the expertise in programming. Some of the tools do need quite a lot of experience to be able to, to program complex um, questionnaires, especially when it comes to questionnaire routing. Um, they are simple routing where if someone is, belongs to, let's say, a particular subgroup. However, if you're looking at a combination of different subgroups 
or routing questionnaires based on the kind of responses people gave on certain a number of questions. Programming these can be very um, difficult and challenging. And so the, the, the learning curve for programming such questionnaires can be very steep. Um, and the technical equipment you need for these electronic tools can be costly. You would have to most likely buy a tablet and um, or a phone to administer these questionnaires, and this can be problematic. Also, the need for power banks, for example, especially when we are looking at hard to reach areas where people or enumerators might lose the power they have on their tablets, they would need power banks. And so for every power bank, for every tablet you buy, you should probably buy a power bank, which could be a backup. And this can be expensive. Also, enumerators have to be trained specifically to use the particular software that you have on the tablet to collect the data. And this can also take quite a lot of time. Um, and one, one of the biggest problems has been the suspicion of respondents when you're using electronic devices, because um, the suspicion is that electronic devices always capture information which um, you are not aware of, which is which might be true. Even though the, the software is not capturing all this information, there is this huge suspicion amongst respondents that data that they have not provided would also be would also be captured. And these are some of the disadvantages of using um, electronic devices. In comparing, you know, electronic and then paper devices, I guess it's always about making the right decision. You are faced with that decision and what do you do? There is really no um, hard, correct answer for this, but this always depends on what the research is about and then what you want to achieve at the end of it. An example here is an, um, a randomized control trial where data collectors were randomly assigned to households or interviews, either with, um, with a paper form or a computer assisted form. Now what was realized was that for interviews that used the computer assisted forms, there were less routing errors, which we talked about, and we, it's, it's very understandable why there were fewer routing errors, because everything with the computer assisted tools are automated. There were very few missing entries, because with the computer assisted programmed interviews, you can restrict the responses such that enumerators would have to make sure that all answers are provided so that there is less missing data. So I guess the thing, the point over here is that when you have missing data, when there is a blank, it's very difficult to tell as a researcher what that means. A blank could mean zero or it could mean I don't know. And these are not the same. However, with, with using paper forms, enumerators always have the tendency of leaving places unfilled. And once that happens, you get back to data entry and you realize that you are missing quite a lot of data. However, with the CAPI program tools, what you can do is that you can provide the enumerators with the opportunity to provide an answer so that if a response, if a respondent decides not to answer, they can put in a response that refused to answer. Or if they say they don't know, they would say don't know. And if the answer is actually zero, then you would put in zero. So if you're asking people about their income, the answer options could be that they put in zero, don't know, or refuse to answer. That way as a researcher, then you know it's not a missing data, but it's actually what the respondent actually provided. And this is, this is a huge advantage in terms of dealing with missing data. Um, and also there are very fewer unlikely or the way fewer unlikely and impossible answers because just as I mentioned with the date of birth, you are able to control for some of the responses. And then also interview time reduced by 10%, which is also very likely because with the copy tool, it's very easy to actually go through well, because you're just swiping through the questions. Once you're done, it just moves to the next questions and you save quite a lot of time without having to read through everything to identify whether, for example, you're following the right routing or not. And um, using the, the CAPI tool was what was good for reducing item non response and very efficient in terms of budget, in terms of the cost. And so it's very likely that when you are administering paper forms, you probably most likely spend more time in the field collecting data because it takes longer to administer these tools. Now, there are a number of softwares that are available. Um, so we have Survey Solutions, which is developed by the World Bank. 
service CTO, and then Kubo Collect. Now, the, the difference between them is that, I mean, they are all based on different platforms. However, service CTO and Kubo Collect are based on a very similar platform, which is ODK. Um, and this is commonly used. And I think for the project, for the EUTF project in Uganda, for example, we've, we've been able to use Kubo two, the Kubo Toolbox for tracking attendance of um, um, trainees. And service CTO basically is, is what we use a lot here at C4 ED in the collection of most of our data. And um, the, the downside is that for service CTO, it does come in with a lot of plugins, which can help you in the collection of data. However, with Kobo, you don't have that many plugins. Service CTO comes with a plugin, which allows you to do phone surveys, for example, and do more complex surveys. However, Kobo Collect does not does not provide that kind of support, and that's the disadvantage of it. Now, however, if you're going to go along with, um, you decided to go along with an electronic tool, now you would have to think about how you would administer it. Now, due to um, COVID-19 pandemic, there's been quite a lot of, um, you know, the use of computer-assisted interviews, um, and this has, in, has increased significantly. Now, there have been other tools that have also been used, such as um, interactive voice response, and these um, these are like um, surveys where people or respondents get a call and there's an automated voice that asks them a question and the question would ask them to put in would ask them to put in um, responses where they would um, have to select either one two or three and then there is short messaging surveys which includes using text messaging now these are different different innovations that have come about, especially due to COVID and due to um, the challenges that we've had with reaching certain populations. And so this is very relevant for hard to reach areas. You can, you can program a survey where people just receive an automated call and then you ask them questions and then they enter the answers by pressing certain keys on their phone. However, with these surveys, you can ask very few questions. And that's the disadvantage of it because there's no one who will be ready to stay on the phone to answer so many questions and then be tapping on the phone. Now, just as I mentioned, data collection could be difficult and it's and it's always sometimes it's 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 more difficult than you imagined. And this could be due to conflict or people being in remote areas or the population being mobile or because of the pandemic, um, which has happened recently. Now, due to that, we've been using um, computer assisted telephone interviews and it has become quite common lately um, and this refers to using um, a computer a computer with a telephone or using a telephone or a tablet and using that as a copy tool to to make or collect data now with this you have um, you set up something that looks somewhat of um, a call center or a virtual call center where you have enumerators or interviewers you can call them they call respondents and then collect data. Now, what happens is that respondents' responses are entered interactively. So, whilst whilst respondents are speaking, or whilst respondents, whilst the interviewers ask the questions, they are they are inputting the answers directly onto the tablets, or they are inputting the answers onto the computers that they have or using. Now, the advantage of this is that you are able to track quite a lot of um, data that goes on whilst you're collecting the data. Now, this, this is also advantageous because it allows you to be able to actually um, collect quite a lot of data without having to physically go to places to collect the data. And, and I think CAPI, um, sorry, CATI has been used a lot because they are generally considered to be cheaper as at now. Um, it could be done between five to 15 US dollars, but uh, per respondent. And um, it's expanded quite a lot of, um, you know, possibilities for you when you're looking at data quality checks and monitoring. You are able to look at the phone logs, be able to tell exactly when the interview took place, when the interview ended, whether there were breaks, which hitherto are quite difficult to track. Um, you are able to, um, you are able to record phone conversations. However, these are based on consent and ethics. You would have to think about this also. Um, you are able to also set up a centralized place where the data collection takes place, which means that you could have a supervisor monitoring them without having to actually be on the field. And then you are also able to um, have um, more or less feedback between the teams 
Um, so having the supervisor there means that you are able to provide feedback to the supervisor who is able to communicate with the field team immediately. And this can actually facilitate the quality of data that you collect. Now, it sounds really great. It sounds really interesting. It sounds like the best innovation, but the question is whether, you know, this is the end of in-person interviews. That is with the introduction of phone surveys. Do we think phone surveys are the solution? Do we now just, just you know, forget about in-person interviews? Well, doing phone surveys have some disadvantages, right? Even the best, even the best phone surveys, right, are not always representative of the, the, the sample that you have. Remember when we talked about coverage error. Now it is possible that some of the respondents might not have phones, or it's possible that some respondents might not have phone service where they are. And this could pose a challenge for you in terms of um, coverage error. You would not be able to reach some people. This means that the sample that you reach would most likely be only people who have phones, and this could affect the overall quality of the data that you collect. And also there is attrition. There is also attrition which results from phone numbers not being functional anymore. And this has been quite common in quite a number of um, situations where phone surveys were used. An example was an NGO in Liberia where they attempted to contact respondents during the Ebola. Um, and I think after selection, 43% of the phone numbers were permanently switched off and 23% did not rank. So this is highly based on luck because you could collect data for, of phone numbers. You can collect a number of phone numbers and you can try them and you would not reach any of them. And this is quite, um, this would definitely affect your, your, your sample size. You would lose quite a lot of cases when all these numbers are switched off. Um, and there are some other issues like non-responses where people just refuse to pick the call or people just refuse to answer questions from someone they don't know on the phone. They would rather prefer a face-to-face -face interview. And this is an example of um, a, a, a phone interview we did, which had to do with um, um, employment verification. And we had about 54% completing it and about 28% refusing to actually take part. And that's the disadvantage of phone surveys. It's prone to quite a lot of refusals. So with um, phone interviews, um, they don't, you don't have to let them last more than 30 minutes. And a, a typical questionnaire should be between 20 to 35 questions. And what happens is that this limits the amount of information that you can collect. And that's a, that's a really huge disadvantage when you are using the phone surveys. You cannot collect that much information. In 30 minutes, you have to be done because after 30 minutes, no one really wants to be on the phone. And that's one of the biggest disadvantage of phone surveys. And also think about the sensitive issues that we talked about and then how that contributes to measurement error in the sense that what you want to measure is not exactly what you would get because people are speaking with you on the phone and it's very difficult for you to ask sensitive questions on the phone because they would not want to provide you with information that they think is sensitive over the phone when they have not actually seen you physically. Um, and then also um, it's really hard to, to build rapport and trust among you know, respondents because again, they don't see you, it's just on the phone. And so they would most likely not want to, um, it's really hard to build the, the rapport which would enable you to get um, more responses from your interview. Um, and what happens or what could happen also is that for someone to actually um, leave a phone call, all they have to do is just take the phone and just end the call and that ends the interview and that could actually end your survey. And so these are some of the disadvantages that you could be faced with. So I can see from our time that um, it's already time for break. And so we would um, go on our break for 45 minutes. And then once we are back, we will just finish up with this and then go on to the next session, which has to do with monitoring systems. So I guess it's 1.16. And so we're hoping to be back by two o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone. And so if you have any questions, um, you can please um, write them down in the chat and then we can also address them once we are back. Thank you very much.
there are a few tips here that you could use in terms of helping you make a decision. There is no hard um, answer. There's no correct answer as to whether to use a paper version of a survey or a computer version of a survey. They all have the advantages that they present you with, and you just have to think through as to what kind of data you're looking for. So, for example, um, it would always be good for you to avoid using a phone survey when you're looking at or when you're doing a large comprehensive household survey, because household surveys um, usually take time to administer. On the average, household surveys will take probably about an hour, and having someone on a phone survey for an hour could be quite challenging for you, for the enumerator, and then for the respondent also. So it's always good to avoid that. When you have surveys with uh, with very complex modules, and when you're talking about very complex modules, mostly in agricultural surveys, um, they can get very complex, and using a phone survey might not exactly be the best way to actually capture the data. And when you have, again, some surveys which require that you be there physically to take measurements, for example, physical measurements, including, for example, land size um, or GPS signals or certain anthropometric um, data which require that you be there. Phone surveys would not exactly be appropriate for, for these kinds of surveys. Um, and then surveys that require some kind of visual aid. It is always better for you to be there to show them the visual aid and then get the reaction that you're looking for. However, if you are collecting data um, on one very specific individual, then a, survey, a phone survey would be could be used, um, and this is what we did in the EETF Gambia, where we we're collecting data on individuals who had participated in the Techie Fee program, and that's how come a phone survey was actually really good for that. And then also the survey was a relatively or has for the midline we had a relatively shorter module, which allowed us to be able to use the phone survey. And also, if you have a survey that takes um, data over a specific set of time. So let's say you're taking weekly data or monthly data or quarterly data, which means that you needed to have some contact time with respondents within a certain time space. Phone surveys were phone surveys are definitely um, what you would want to use. Again, it must be short surveys. Then if you have a longer survey, then you should probably look at meeting them face to face. Now, um, if you're looking at reaching people who would otherwise not be accessible, it would be good then to use a phone survey. Now we've talked about phone surveys. We've talked about using the, a normal copy tool with a tablet. We've talked about paper forms. Now we, we talked about, you know, when you have sensitive questions. And when you have sensitive questions, you could use one way you could avoid having measurement error is to use um, a self-administered survey. Um, and this kind of eliminates the the problem with social desirability because people um, social desirability bias because once people are entering the answers into the survey questionnaire they don't have the the, the perception that someone else is listening into them so they think this 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 is only between is between they and the the researcher when there is an enumerator in between them then they think this is two more people or this is like an extra person getting to know more about their private lives and and so self-administered surveys are help you eliminate um, you know, social desirability bias. Um, and setting up web surveys are helpful with that. In terms of the challenges it pays, the participation rate could be really low. Um, one example of such uh, tools is, um, is, is being used in, in Kenya. Um, and this is um, it's a self-reporting mobile application where people who have gone through gender-based violence are able to report it using um, a self-administered tool. So every time that they go through um, any sort of violence, they are able to report this using the tool. And this helps actually collect data on, 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 on how um, prevalent gender-based violence is. So we've talked about you know, the data collection methods that you could use to help you avoid uh, poor data quality. We've talked about the copy, we've talked about the, the paper versions, we've talked about phone surveys, and then just briefly talked about um, self-administered survey. Now, also lately, you could use GIS to help you plan your surveys or to help you get data quality. 
So in terms of helping you plan surveys, the quality of your data always depends on how well you plan your survey. And GIS lately has, has become quite important in planning surveys because it provides, you know, geographic you know, information about, about the places that you would want to study. And it shows you different kinds of information about the built up environment, including streets, buildings, vegetations, and anything that is around the study communities. Now this information is very useful for any kind of survey because it tells you what you should be expecting when you go out onto the field. Okay, now um, in terms of um, specifically for geographical, um, for, for data collection, um, it, it, what you could use is that um, it could be integrated into your sampling frame. So if you are not sure about your sampling frame, you could use GIS to actually capture your sample frame. And I think this is what was done in the EUTF, EUTF project. When you don't have a sample, a sample frame that exists, you could easily use GIS to capture information to provide you with your sampling frame. Now, how can you integrate GIS to facilitate high data collection in hard to reach areas? Now, one thing that you should be looking at is about, you know, carefully planning your data. Now, better understanding your population, sampling, as I mentioned, tracking um, and planning the surveys, and then also data checks. Um, now, to better understand the population that's being surveyed, you should be able to look at the, the, the population and help you strategize as to who and where you're going to be collecting the data from. And so once you have a better idea as to how the geographic nature of the, the study communities are, it provides you with a leverage or an advantage to be able to set yourself up for anything that could happen out on the field in terms of, for example, contacting wrong respondents. You could use, in, in theory, in theory, you could use just a simple map to know where specific study communities are located. However, with GIS, you don't only get to know about the location, but you are able to, for example, superimpose certain data, which includes, um, it, which includes, for example, the population distribution or the density to help you plan your, your data collection as well. And so with data collection planning, you, you just don't want to know about locations of steady communities, but what is around to help you figure out how to go about it. In terms of tracking survey respondents, it could be very important for you based on data that has been provided by respondents. If you have a baseline, for example, you are able to have your, like give yourself an idea as to where your respondents would be located. And so um, I will show you an example of how we use this to plan for one of our data collections in um, one of the EETF projects. Um, so what happens is that the survey team is able to plan data collection accordingly. And this includes, for example, selecting the right enumerators and field supervisors. Um, selecting the right enumerators means that you'll be able to select enumerators who are very conversant with where the respondents are located. If you just have names and phone numbers of respondents, for example, it's difficult for you to actually plan exactly how or where the enumerator should come from, especially if there is a language barrier. You would want an enumerator who speaks a number of languages or a particular language. And so once you have an idea of the specific location, this would be very helpful for you. And also it helps you estimate travel time and other resources that you would need to put into the data collection because travel time plays a huge role in terms of how you plan your data. You could spend quite a lot of hours on the road if you are not able to actually plan the specific um, who goes to which particular data point and who goes to the other. But once you have GIS, you are able to, to track this. Um, the sad part about this is that it, um, it's highly dependent on the data that you put into the system, which means that you need to have the data available. Now, if you don't have it available, then it becomes problematic. And so um, if you're dealing with very remote areas where there's very little data available, it becomes very difficult for you to use GIS. However, there's a wealth of information out there that keeps um, getting um, rich every day. And so it would be really good if you leverage on what is currently available to plan your data collection. Also, learning to use GIS is not exactly um, 
there's a steep learning curve also. And so it takes some time for you to get conversant with it. And so that might take some bits of your time. Um, over here is a diagram. I don't know if you can see, but if you can see all those red spots, the red spots have numbers in there. And this was what we used for Gambia to actually strategize as to how to collect the data. If you'd realize, you can see that you have all the, you have most of the respondents located in one particular area. It's highly concentrated, one particular area. And so for this data collection, we did not have to plan for people to go into some of these areas. We had to, so we started sweeping from where we had more respondents and then kind of narrowed down. And whilst we were covering much more of these, we sent one or two other enumerators to start collecting data from this side of, 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 of Gambia. And so without this, we would have been a bit blind in terms of knowing exactly where the respondents were and planning how transportation would be organized. And if you can see, there are only two respondents here on this side. And, and so we, we only needed one enumerator to actually go there to collect the data from these um, respondents. And so this is an example of how GIS can help you plan your data collection. And then also in terms of um, CAPI, um, what it does is that based on the CAPI tools that people use, you are able to use the GIS information to know whether enumerators are following the, the, the sampling protocol that you provided them. Now, this is an example of um, a data collection that went on, and it's, it shows you that the, the data was collected within the boundaries that had been set for the enumerators. Now, in the next example that I'm going to show you, you would see that these were the boundaries that were given to the enumerators. And then this is where they collected from the collected data for the control group, which is outside the area that we're talking about. And this could be problematic for you in terms of what kind of data they are collecting. This is another example showing um, data that was not collected within the boundary. So this clearly shows that the enumerators did not follow the sampling, um, the sampling um, protocol that was given them. And this can be very problematic uh, for your data collection. So these are some examples of how GIS can be used to improve the quality of your data. Firstly, by helping you come up with a sample frame, it can help you plan your data collection, and then it can also help you track whether enumerators are following the protocols that you have provided for them. So um, at this point, I think this is the last slide and that's the end of this session. Um, and at this point, I would hand over to my colleague, Gida, who would be doing this presentation. Thank you, Ali. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gida. I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, maybe someone from our side can confirm, Ali. Yes, we can hear and see. You. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm very happy um, to be here. I'm Gida Karbala. I'm an impact and evaluation specialist at CIPRED, but I also manage monitoring projects. And I'm very excited to be giving this training on the link between these two evaluation methods and how they are different from each other. Um, in the coming 30 minutes, I will give a very quick overview on uh, two methods that are quite complex. Um, nevertheless, I would be very happy if you just um, use the um, raising hand <laughs> function in Teams to um, share with me any questions you might have or even experiences, particularly on uh, monitoring systems. So please do not hesitate to interrupt me um, during the presentation. Okay, so for now, I will share my screen. Um, all right, so um, as um, Ali mentioned this is a quick overview on uh, monitoring systems and how they um, integrate into uh, counterfactual impact evaluations. Um, and at the end of um, this short session, um, you will be able to um, tell more about the misconceptions um, that exist usually about the monitoring systems and how they differ 
um, from counterfactual impact evaluations um, or if they differ at all. Um, and you will be also able to describe basic steps um, or the core steps required whenever you plan to build um, an MNE framework. And also I will give a very quick um, overview on some innovative ways to collect uh, monitoring data. Um, so the aim is that at the end of um, the session, we answer two main questions. So this is only a 30 minute training and I wouldn't want to overwhelm you with too many questions that we answer, but it's important that at the end of the session, we at least have the answers for these two questions. The first one is whether monitoring um, um, monitoring evaluation is the same as counterfactual impact evaluation. And the second is if we have monitoring data and a monitoring system, do we need counterfactual impact evaluations? So I will be getting back to this slide at the very end of the training to just give, give very quick and brief answers to these two questions. Um, so on this slide, you should already uh, get a feeling for what the answer is. So this slide presents the different evaluation types that usually project teams think about whenever they are planning an um, intervention. And here you already see that um, there are four different uh, bubbles, each representing an evaluation approach and monitoring evaluation and impact evaluation are put into two different bubbles, indicating that these are two separate evaluations um, serving different purposes. As a side note, so I will be going through each of these evaluations briefly, but as, as a side note, each of these evaluations can be very heavy on data collection. So I'm, I'm confident that the training that my colleagues gave um, yesterday and today um, would be very helpful for you if you're planning any of these evaluations actually. So starting with the needs assessment, in a very early stage of any um, intervention design, um, the first step is to identify what the, what the challenges are and what the problem exactly is. So in most of my, um, uh, during most of my presentation, I will be focusing on one example, um, which relates to vocational training with the aim of enhancing employment. I think this is um, an intervention that uh, you've probably, most of you probably have experience already working with, um, either as part of the ETF projects or otherwise. So I will be using this example in most cases. Regarding the needs assessment at this stage, um, the project team would identify unemployment as the main challenge and probably might decide to conduct some quantitative and qualitative data to learn more about the challenges leading to this um, problem of unemployment. So maybe um, issues such as skills mismatch might be identified. At this stage, the project team would also think um, or deduce from these um, uh, identified challenges what potential activities the project should focus on. As a second step, um, the project team would think about conducting a theoretical program evaluation. So here um, you would conduct a desk review looking into what um, information out there um, help you identify the right activities and sub-activities that help tackle the challenges and the pro problems that you identified in the first stage during the needs assessment. Also, as a side note, it could very much be that during, during your desk review, you come across counterfactual impact evaluations that others have conducted on activities relevant to addressing the challenge that you've identified. These counterfactual impact evaluations might have been uh, conducted in a different uh, context, um, but um, addressing the same problem. And um, that's usually very, very valuable actually at this stage because you would already learn a lot about the impact that the um, activities conducted have on the challenge that you also plan to address in your project. 
So I would not say more about these two points because the time is limited and I would like to say more about uh, the coming point on um, monitoring evaluation. So at this point, um, after you've finalized the needs assessment and the theoretical program evaluation, you're at a point where um, a logic framework has been um, developed already. And I'm confident that you um, are all with uh, all familiar with what a logical framework is and what a theory of change is. But just um, to to briefly um, define that, um, a logical framework is an easy to read diagram that gives a quick snapshot of the objectives of the project uh, from the very um, initial levels down to the output level. And usually it also includes details about the indicators that you plan to um, to track or um, evaluate during the implementation of your project. Once you have a logical framework, um, you would start thinking about developing your monitoring system. A monitoring system, as the um, MAME suggests, its aim is to monitor whether the implementation of your activities and sub activities is going as as planned. So if we go back to the example on uh, training and employment. Using your monitoring system, you would want to track whether all the training sessions that you planned for took place and whether they took place on time and whether they were attended by the right, right number of participants, sorry, by the right participants and then by the right number of participants, uh, whether the material used um, is aligned with the needs and expectations of the participants. And all of this, of course, will feed into uh, lessons learned and backstopping. So while you're tracking the process of implementation in details, this will also allow you into uh, to identify any challenges or um, issues in the implementation and to address those in a timely manner before it's too late or before you run into the um, the issue of wasting resources or being inefficient. Um, monitoring is also very important for accountability and for reporting back to the donors in a transparent manner. What the monitoring system will not tell you is the impact of your project. Um, the monitoring system might include and should include indicators at the output and outcome level. However, it is not able to tell you if the project that you implemented have caused an impact on the outcome variables or the indicators that you um, expected to cause an impact on. This is the job of impact evaluation. During impact evaluations, the um, causal impact of your design of your implementation can be identified. And by causal, I mean that um, during impact evaluations, we use methods that isolate any other factors that might have um, also influenced the outcome variables of interest. And it isolates only the impact of your project. So for example, um, going back again to the intervention on vocational training, um, you probably hypothesized that um, conducting vocational trainings um, would increase employability of, let's say, the target group is youth, and you expect that six months after the training, um, attendees would be um, working in a job relevant to the training they attended. If you only look at the monitoring data or the tracking data that your monitoring system will uh, collect for you um, and you see an increase in employment, you might run into the false conclusion of saying the program have caused increase in employment. The reason why I say this might be a false conclusion is because there are so many factors that are also going on in the area of implementation or in the country of implementation that might have also caused this increase in employment. And the monitoring system will not be able to isolate these effects or these factors. 
why the impact evaluation would be able to do that. For example, the country, the country might just be experiencing economic growth and um, employment might have increased to not only the target group by the training, but to all youth in the country. Impact evaluation would be able to tell you if that is the case. And then finally, um, you would want to know if the effect that is caused by this intervention is cost effective. So whether the percentage increase in employment is high enough to justify the costs of the intervention. If there is increase in employment, but this increase is very minimal compared to um, the amount of money invested in this intervention or in conducting these trainings, then you might want to reconsider some aspects of the design. So based on this, um, I hope it's um, I, I'm able to give you a quick um, overview on why these um, evaluations are different um, and why they are answering different questions and serving different purposes. But what is also important to know is that they are highly dependent on each other. So conducting a successful impact evaluation is highly dependent on the monitoring system or the quality of the monitoring system that you have. Similarly, being able to conduct a a quality cost efficiency analysis is highly dependent on how good your impact evaluation is and how good your monitoring system is. In the coming slide, I will be demonstrating how impact evaluation and monitoring are dependent on each other. So here you see um, the theory of change. This might look um, a bit different for you if you use a different template for your theory of change. Um, that's that's OK. So there are different ways of presenting the theory, the theory of change. Um, the most important thing is that the elements uh, or the basic elements of a theory of change are inputs, outputs, outcome and impact. And again, um, going back to the example on vocational training, um, in this case, Inputs would be um, hiring the required train, tra trainers, uh, developing the training material, um, hiring the focal points responsible for advertising this training and matching participants to the right training, developing application forms, and so on. And then these inputs, as per your theory of change, should translate directly into outputs that are defined in your logical framework. These outputs in this particular example would be the number of trainees attending these training, the number of training sessions taking place, and for instance, also the length of the training of the training. So if you plan that each training takes place for six months, then this is also something you want to track um, and your monitoring system. Um, on top of the of the first um, arrow, you see that I wrote a causal link. Um, at this stage, using the monitoring system only, you are able to draw a causal link between inputs and outputs. So your monitoring system, if the structures are set up correctly, it should be enough for you to link um, all the inputs used, all the resources, funds used to specific um, activities or specific outputs. So at this stage, you don't need an impact evaluation. However, going on um, in the theory of change, you see there's an, um, a box for outcomes and impact. So outcome represents uh, the short term um, changes that you expect your program or your project to um, to introduce. In our example, this would be um, increased employment. So on the short run, you expect that, um, um, let's say, trainees six months after graduation would be employed, and this would go under outcomes. So the issue here is that the monitoring system on its own is not able to um, to provide you with this causal link from outputs to outcomes. 
Um, for that, you will need an impact evaluation. And the reason is, as explained earlier, an impact evaluation will be able to isolate all other factors that might have caused you to see an increase in employment that um, is only linked to the project itself and uh, not to other things going on at the same time. Same thing applies to impact. So in this case, impact would be the long term uh, of the long term uh, objective of the um, of the project or the intervention itself. So using this um, result um, chain of results or theory of change, um, you can see how um, impact evaluation and monitoring are both very crucial for um, for any project and how they link um, to each other and depend on each other. But to make it more clear how this dependency look like, I would like to just very quickly give um, jump one slide and give an example on this. Um, so, again, our our example on training. So, looking at the monitoring system to check if the implementation is going as planned, your MNE expert tells you that um, all the qualified trainers have been um, employed, and they are attending training sessions, and that the material is um, is developed and is being used, and it is aligned with the needs of the trainees. And then at this stage, you um, implement an impact evaluation to see whether your hypothesis that training sessions increase employability is correct. And after conducting the impact evaluation, you find that there is no change in, the, in employment six months following the training. And you conclude that uh, providing vocational training to youth is not enough or is, the, is not the right approach to increase employment. However, if you also implement, uh, let's say, if you have a verification system in place or an independent MNE um, expert who comes in and points out that you missed in your MNE system to control for attendance, then this would explain why your impact evaluation gave you a wrong conclusion. Or, um, or a wrong policy recommendation. So the idea is that if the monitoring system is not functioning as planned, or if it misses on an important monitoring, monitoring activity, you are risking that the impact evaluation you conduct gives you a wrong conclusion and you um, might decide based on this conclusion to change the design of your intervention or not to scale up and clearly this would be not the right thing to do. So going back to this uh, slide that I skipped. Um, so to, sum to summarize um, what we just saw from uh, the previous slide on the theory of change, your monitoring system will be mostly focused on outputs, on the output level, and it will uh, it should be able to answer questions such as how many resources were spent and on which outputs, how many resources are still available for which output, and to what extent the project is, is close to achieving the targeted output. It should also help you collect lesson, lessons, learn, lessons learned and also know when to stop and correct for certain um, challenges or issues that come up during the implementation stage. Whereas the impact evaluation will focus more on the outcome and the impact level. Okay, so now that we um, have identified how impact evaluation, counterfactual impact evaluations and monitoring evaluations differ from each other and what purposes each of these two evaluations um, serve, I would like to give a very quick overview on um, how to set up a monitoring system. 
Monitoring systems can be very um, complex and uh, to set up and they get more complex the more complicated the design of the intervention is and the more sub activities and components there are. But at the base or the core of every monitoring system is um, certainly the theory of change and um, logical framework. But following that is the performance management plan. The performance management uh, plan describes for you in details um, how each activity and sub activity um, in your intervention links to um, an indicator or a set of indicator. And then it describes how you plan to measure this indicator, the tool that you will use to collect the required data, the type of data that will be collected, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, how often you would be collecting this data, who's responsible for collecting the data, how it will be reported on and how often, and the verification method that you will use to conduct quality assurance on the conducted data. Um, you might choose to develop a more detailed performance management plan, and that would be an indicator plan, which is basically just, um, yeah, it's a, just a more detailed version of, of a performance management plan, uh, which also includes something called an indicator tracking table. Um, this is a table that tracks every um, um, indicator, performance indicator on a monthly basis. So after setting up the basics of a monitoring framework, the indicator plan, uh, indicator tracking table, and the performance management plan, um, you will have to think about all the monitoring activities that are relevant for your intervention and the different monitoring levels that you have. So again, going back to the um, vocational training example, you probably want to um, conduct monitoring at the training uh, center level, um, at the focal points advertising for the training, and also at the beneficiary level. You might also want to conduct a context monitoring, so to check if um, this can be done using qualitative data um, to check if there's anything going on in the country or in the area of intervention that might, might have interfered in uh, the implementation plans or have affected uh, the implementation of the project. After determining the different monitoring activities and levels, um, you will have to develop monitoring tools suitable for each of these monitoring activities and also determine um, who will be collecting this data and how. Um, with every data collection, um, there is um, a need to define a sampling approach, which I'm confident you discussed in details already with my colleagues. Um, and then at the very end, you have to decide on how you plan to report on all this data that is being um, collected. And by how, I mean not only uh, frequency, um, the frequency of reporting, but also the data formatting that you plan to use, whether you plan to use tables, graphics, um, and so on. So all in all, when you're setting um, an M&E framework, you want to have very concrete answers to the following questions. What do we want to monitor? How do we want to monitor? When do we want to monitor these indicators? And who will do the monitoring? So I see that my time is almost over um, and I'm almost done with my presentation, I just would like to quickly show you an example um, of an indicator plan um, that details the, um, the indicators uh, relating to the inputs, um, the data source for every indicator, the measurement of the indicator, frequency of measuring, uh, you can add budget, um, and so on. So this is a really just um, an example, it can be, you can develop uh, more detailed indicator plans and add more uh, factors here to, 
to track. Before ending the presentation, just very quickly about um, ways of collecting monitoring data. So um, as you have uh, probably noticed from this uh, presentation, monitoring can be um, very complex uh, because it includes um, different levels of data collection. Uh, it includes so many parties, um, each collecting their own uh, data. And of course, um, if you are working with multiple uh, implementing partners and each have their own uh, monitoring systems, then there should be um, a way to integrate all these monitoring systems and aggregate the data together while minim minimizing um, error as much as possible and ensuring that the data quality is um, is good. So this is this can be um, challenging, and that's why um, there are some approaches that can help you um, reduce um, errors and automize your monitoring system as much as possible. Um, and these are just examples from some of the projects that I um, have been working on. So using digitalized uh, um, approaches to collecting data will reduce entry error significantly. And um, in one of my projects, what um, was very nice to use and um, it really simplifies monitoring a lot was the use of barcodes. So this was an intervention on um, cash transfer and every beneficiary had um, a beneficiary card with um, a, uniquely, a unique barcode that was scanned at the point of distribution and this data was then automatically fed into um, the MIS or the monitoring and information system. Um, similar systems can be used for uh, trainings as well, where beneficiaries uh, receive barcodes or also if beneficiaries agree, passive data can be collected. So passive data is basically uh, having the beneficiaries um, um, downloading an app on their smartphones and this app um, every time they um, enter the training um, area or the training room uh, would detect their GPS and um, confirm that they have attended and then it would confirm when they have left um, the training. Also, if there's um, um, a way to integrate monitoring and information systems together. So for example, um, in the case of different training centers collecting uh, monitoring data on training sessions, um, it, it would be um, helpful to have one platform where, where all this data is available and all training uh, providers have access to it um, because this platform can then be used as a referral system based on the qualification of the trainee. Um, the training center can refer them or um, any um, agency helping with employment can refer the trainee uh, and match them to the right um, job um, in the job market. So I see my time is up and I even took uh, additional five minutes. Um, I would like to pause and give you a chance to, um, to uh, ask me questions or to share any um, experiences about your monitoring system or innovative approaches you've used uh, to simplify the collection of monitoring data before I end the session. Um, this this focuses on research ethics and data protection. Um, so we've gone over the past few days, we've talked about data, data, data. We've talked about how data is important for um, impact evaluations. We've talked about how data quality can be affected by one or two other, so many other um, factors. Um, and we've just talked about monitoring systems and very central to this, all these topics has been data. And so we've, we've gone round, 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 round about data. Um, but then with, um, with data comes a huge responsibility um, in terms of 
the safety and privacy of respondents who provide us who provide us with the data that we use for our impact evaluations. And it's for that reason that we have this session, which looks at research ethics and data protection. Um, the objectives are to explain some of the practical requirements for ethical clearance for counterfactual impact evaluation. We would probably not be able to go through everything in terms of the practical requirements, but I believe the one of the most important things now in terms of um, ethics in research has to do with getting ethical clearance. We'll spend some time talking about what underpins these um, clearances or these ethical clearances or ethical research in general, and then also look at um, what type of data needs to be protected and what kind of methods need or what kind of methods you can use. Um, so we'll just quickly start. Um, so in a study interviewing trainers, a study interviewing trainers may discover that they are behaving against the ethics of their profession. Reporting this misconduct to the authorities could harm the trainers, while not reporting could harm trainees. What would you do? So, I mean, I just um, a brief answer in terms of like, you know, if you have, you discover in your data collection that trainers are going against their ethics or the ethics of their profession, um, reporting them to the authorities could get them sacked, um, while not reporting could actually endanger the lives of the trainees. What would you do in this circumstance? If there's anyone who can give a brief answer, really appreciate that. Ellie, sorry for uh, interrupting you and come in here. Uh, would it be possible to make the slides on the full screen so we can see it uh, bigger because we see it not in the presentation mode yet? Oh, OK. OK, all right, sure. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. How about this? Perfect, perfect. Yes, Thanks. awesome, great. <laughs> OK, so maybe should I read this? I'll read over it again. So in a steady interviewing trainers, um, you, you you discovered that um, the trainers are going against the ethics of um, of their profession. Now, if you report to them, they could get sacked. Um, and if you don't report to them, it, it poses a danger to the trainees. What would you do? Would you go ahead to report to them or you would just keep it quiet? So I guess. So if, if, if no one is answering, I could probably just go ahead in such a circumstance. It is always important to think about the safety of everyone around you, including your respondents and including the, the, the people who are around them. Um, and in this case, I would say that it's very important that they you report this case to. To the authorities who are responsible for this um, this profession. Um, a second example is that um, a study on the employment returns of vocational and technical skills for young people in Ghana is currently ongoing. Now, one of the beneficiaries who is 16 years old is approached to be interviewed. The respondent reads the consent section and asks relevant questions about the study and shows a good understanding of the research. Is it OK to continue asking the question? Now, these two scenarios that I just read are scenarios that most likely you could or you could be faced with on the field, and it happens more often than not. And in all these cases, you would have to think really carefully or take a step back and think really carefully about how to conduct ethical researches. In these cases, it's very important that you have a, a good understanding of what the ethical demands are when you are doing um, research. And I think one of the most ultimate one of the most ultimate goal when it comes to ethical research is the protection of human subjects or respondents in the, for that matter and their right to privacy is also central to ethical data collection and so you always need to put the human being or whoever you are dealing with you need to put you need to put them you need to put them first in terms of making your decision now in terms of data collection, if you're thinking about data collection and it comes to ethics in data collection, the core question that comes up is whether your research protocols are you know, um, comfortable for respondents and the community as a whole. And so because of that, these protocols, you have to design them right from the word go when you're designing the study because 
at the, at the design of the study, uh, like a design of the study at that stage, you can make changes or you can make sure that you take care of all, um, all factors or all parts of the research that could be harmful to human beings or to your respondents. And so it's really, really important that you take this very seriously at the beginning of the study and not in the middle of it or at the far end of it. It is really important that you design your protocols at the beginning. And this demands that you design a framework which is proactive, proactive in the sense that it anticipates some of the ethical challenges you might have on the field and then put in place measures for you to succumb these um, challenges that you would be, be coming across. And then secondly, you need to have something that is more reactive in the sense of reacting to what might happen, something that you did not foresee. You need to make sure that you have all of these included in your protocol or in your ethical framework. And for that, these are the things that you would need in order for you to conduct um, an ethical data collection. And when you think about ethical data collection, there are a number of things. They cut across quite a lot of um, broad issues, but we've just narrowed it down to three issues which we think are important to look at when you're collecting data in terms of ethical data collection. Now, one of the major points is the informed consent section of your um, questionnaire. The second part has to do with obtaining um, ethical clearance from the institutional review boards. And then the third part is the state and local permits. So we will just run through each of these um, briefly. So in terms of informed consent, every respondent has a right to decide not to be part of a research. Regardless of whatever the research objective is, every respondent has a right to decide whether they want to be part of it. And that right is guaranteed or is enshrined in almost every national um, or like all state regulations or conventions. And as a result of that, you need to make sure that you obtain informed consent from the respondents before you get on to the collection of data. And also, it is important that when you think about informed consent, you don't just think about the consent section, but the informed consent. So informed consent is very different from consent because informed consent, informed consent provides the respondents with enough information for them to make a decision about whether they want to be part of the study. And so you need to make sure that the respondents have a clear understanding of what the content of the consent note is. When it comes to the language of it, because for most, for quite a number of studies, when you are dealing with um, respondents who might not be able to understand English, for example, the question is whether you translate this into the local language. It is important that you translate it into the local language if English cannot be understood by most of your respondents. However, you also need to think whether respondents can read the informed consent section, especially when you are dealing with um, self-administered questionnaires in a local language. You need to think through whether the respondents can actually read these, these um, consent sections. Um, and also it's very, very important that they have a clear understanding that once they give consent, this consent can be withdrawn at any point in time, even if it's you know in the middle of the survey, um, once, once um, the respondents say that they do not want to be, they do not want to continue the survey, this has to be respected. And you need to make the respondents aware of this when you present the consent notes to them. Let them know that they can actually refuse to be part of the interview midway. And then also comes the issue, which I, I guess came up earlier on about disclosure of gifts or rewards to respondents. Um, it is also important that you disclose this to them in the con informed consent section. However, it's, it is debatable in terms of, it is a point of controversy as to what kind of gifts or rewards you should be giving respondents for interviews. Basically giving respondents some sort of gifts or rewards is just to compensate them for the lost time. So it, that is how you would differentiate between a gift and a bribe, because it's a thin line between a gift becoming a bribe. And when it is a bribe, respondents would want to answer questions in a particular way. Or if respondents know that they are going to receive a gift, they are going to, um, they are going to, if they know they are going to receive a gift, then they might want to give you answers that you want to hear. So it's really important that you disclose these gifts. Now as to 
the value of this gift is something that you would have to determine locally by speaking with local experts because you need to make sure that the, the respondents do not um, do not measure or place their participation in the survey on the same pedestal on the same level of value as the gift they are getting. Once the gift is of an extreme value, it's of like you know high value, then respondents tend to think that you are bribing them to be part of a of a, of a survey, and most likely you would you would get responses that might be biased. So it is a very sensitive topic in terms of whether respondents should be given um, gifts or rewards or bribes. It is not wrong to give them bribes. Uh, sorry, it's not wrong to give them gifts, but you need to to think very carefully about what this gift could induce when given to them. However, respondents have to be, in case you're spending or you're taking a lot of their time, you have to compensate them for the lost time. Um, it's very important to note also that informed consent for children must be always be obtained from parents and guardians. So, so minors can give you consent regardless of their age. If they are minors, their consent is null and void. And so you need to be very careful when you are speaking with people who are minors, especially. Um, so I think for in some of our surveys, so sometimes there could be a discrepancy between people who are beneficiaries of a program and then what you want to do in terms of um, the impact evaluation. Let's say the age of um, the, the age requirements of being part of a program or like being a beneficiary might be, let's say, um, someone who is 15 years or 16 years. However, when you are going to collect data from people who are 15 years, 16 years, you need to make sure that you get the informed consent of their parents before you ask them any questions. And for each, for the informed consent section, for you to have that, you know, um, informed consent section, which is comprehensive, you need to make sure that this, this um, consent note includes the purpose of the study the procedures or risks and benefits, which includes what you are going to go through. So you could tell them, OK, we are going to go through these questions or these series of questions, and these are the risks or, and these are the benefits that you could get. Um, and then their rights. And so their rights include their right to not be part of the study, their right to reject to be part of the study, and their right to reject to being part of the study without having any consequences. And then also, to ensure their confidentiality, that every data that they share with you would be confidential, that only people who are in responsible positions or people who have the responsibility of having the data would have it. Um, the contact information, you need to provide some sort of contact information for respondents to be able to reach out to if they have any questions with regards to, you know, anything about the study, you should provide them with some of these information so that respondents can reach out to you and clarify certain issues. Um, it is very important that you provide this contact information because we've had experiences where respondents did not understand exactly what the surveys were about and they contacted um, the numbers that we provided and once a better explanation was given to them, they decided to be part of the study. And so in one way or the other, it could actually help you reduce non-response. And then also never forget to provide the final response for them, whether they want to take part in the study, yes or no. It's always a hard line. It's either they want to be part of the study or they don't want to be part of the study. Now, apart from the informed consent, we have the ethical clearance session. And the, the ethical clearance session has become quite popular lately because almost every um, country, almost every jurisdiction has ethical review boards. I know that in some countries there are still, there is no um, established process of um, obtaining ethical um, clearance. Um, ethical review boards in general seek to ensure um, the protection of participants of research. And they are mainly, they are main, um, their main principles are respect for persons and um, ensuring that the respondents are treated well. Um, and so it's really important that we submit ourselves to this kind of review to ensure that our researches that we are carrying are ethically, our researches that we are carrying are ethically, um, are following the ethical procedures. Um, so for some countries that don't have IRB institutions on their own, 
most of the universities have taken the lead on providing these kinds of clearance. Um, and for most, for most IRB approval processes, some of the documents you must submit include the documentation for your study design, your data collection methodology, your questionnaire, your informed consent notes, and then the potential risk mitigation actions, and then also who the principal investigators are. And in some cases, you would, you would be asked for um, a certificate that accredits you to actually conduct, um, conduct research using human respondents. And so you need to have all of these documents um, ready. Um, so I had a few questions here which I wanted to ask, but I guess um, I would just gloss over them because we don't have that much time. Um, but this refers to um, uh, having um, an RCT. And then would you require an IRB if you are going to um, people from the host communities to be trained and others not chosen to be trained? If yes, why? So would you require an IRB for an RCT when people are going to be randomized? And then also when you're collecting data from children from let's say class like you know grade four to five on their preparation to professional life now would you need so these questions are not sensitive questions would you still need to collect um, um ethical clearance and the answer to these questions are yes regardless of whether it's harm, harmless when it comes to children you always need to make sure that you get ethical clearance and then when it comes to randomization randomization is always permitted once the intervention that you are implemented is not a basic need and a basic need being that for example the right to water these these um some of these um basic basic rights that everyone has you cannot really subject them to randomization or you should not do that they are not ethical it's not ethically right to do that now the reason why all oh, for so many people going through IRB processes can be really challenging and that's because it takes quite a lot of time to get together um, an IRB approval process or to get through it because there are quite a lot of requirements in terms of the documentation that you have to submit and so you need to make sure that you prepare way ahead of time every single document that you need to submit get the requirements that they ask for get everything prepared and submit them very early on time for the questionnaires, they're always going to ask you for the questionnaires. Make sure you have a draft of it, submit it. Once they look at it, they will give you, they could give you an approval. And if there are major changes you have to make to it, you can always submit an amendment to these IRB approvals. So for many IRB approvals, um, they are coming from academic institutions. And usually the demands from academic institutions are quite different from what the reality is on the ground. And so you have to always be careful about the ethical dilemmas you would face in terms of ethical demands based on the academic part of ethical review boards and then also the reality of what you face on the ground. Now, ethical approvals are not exactly a, a replacement for local institutions or permissions. Now, research permits or local approvals are also equally important and you need to put in a lot of effort to obtain these permits also from local institutions they do not so you also need to put in as much effort to obtain letters from for example if it's the federal ministry or if it's the agency that is in charge of statistics it is always important to inform them about you know data collections that you want to do because in one way or the other they could be helpful to you or opening doors to you to reach an out respondent this is even more important when you have um, local authorities they can provide you with um, access to the population. Once local authorities agree to data collections, they always open doors to local communities and help you in your data collection such that you can actually um, avoid having non-responses. Because once traditional authorities are not aware of your data collections, honestly speaking, I think from, from experience, it's always going to be very difficult for you to obtain any form of data at all. And so it's very important that you do not substitute um, ethical review board or ethical clearances with local permits these are two different things and you need to make sure that you obtain them separately now what all of these mean is that you need to get your ethical approval you need to make sure your informed consent note is well designed to ensure that you respect the privacy of all the participants of your research and then you need to make sure that your, every protocol of yours is proactive 
and reactive. And you need to make sure that you obtain the, 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 the local permits in addition to your ethical clearance for you to conduct your data collection. So that's about ethical considerations when it comes to data collection. Um, we have one section more, which I probably have to go through quickly um, because we are hard pressed for time. And this has to do with data security and protection. Um, again, with data comes a huge responsibility um, and data security and data protection is one of the main issues that we should be thinking about when we start collecting people's personal information. Now, when you think about um, IRBs, right, they demand that each person has a certificate, like, you know, in terms of how to, um, whether they are people who are competent in handling data. Now, this is because um, we need to ensure that all the personal data that people have provided are protected. Now, what has to be protected? Um, you need to determine this very earlier on. So right from the start of your project, you need to identify which data is confidential and which is not. And for those that are confidential, you need to make sure that you decide very early to take these data out before, before, before sharing it with anyone or before doing any form of analysis. Um, that's what we refer to as personally identifiable information. Now, personally identifiable information are what you refer to as um, they come in the form of direct or indirect identifiers. Now, this is information with which you can identify respondents by. The direct ones are like ones referring to their names, phone numbers, those that directly identify the individuals. Now, uh, indirect ones are what you could combine with other variables to actually identify people. If you could identify people based on, let's say, their, their household they belong to, and then their education, for example, or ethnicity, you can easily find these people out. Now, these two types of data sets need to be taken very good care of, or they need to be protected very well. Now, so I'll just skip over this. Before you share any data on any of the electronic devices, you need to make sure that um, all of this data has been taken out in terms of the personally identifiable information. And the way to do that, is going through a process of data encryption or de-identifying the data. So data encryption generally looks at changing the structure of data such that it would hide its real meaning from people so that they cannot actually get access to the real information that is that is being um, hidden in the data. Um, and it's very, very important that um, every single data that we collect, be it phone numbers, names, addresses, we keep all of these data encrypted. We need to keep them encrypted so that no one can have access to them. And for those, and for those that we do not have encrypted, we need to make sure that we de-identify them. So de-identifying data means that taking out the names of people from the data set and replacing them with a pseudonym. For example, instead of for a name like Nathan Sivright, you could have a name, um, an index number, for example, like two, two, five, six, seven. Um, no one can identify him by that number. But once you have the name in there, people can do that. Once you are able to de-identify the data, then it becomes um, much more safer for people or for respondents when they provide their data to you. Um, and again, so just as I mentioned, it includes pseudonymization or anonymization. So in terms of anonymization, that means that taking the names out totally or pseudonymization means that giving it a different name, more or less like a placeholder where you can actually what you can do is have two data sets, have a different, you know, pseudonyms, so, and these, like, you know, you can actually easily merge them based on the pseudonym from one data set to the other. And you need to do this very early once you import the data. So once the data is imported from your server, try as much as possible to de-identify the data. In terms of data checks, it is always important to make sure that um, you, you can go back to the, you need to make sure that you store the data in a way that you can go back to it for data checks. Okay, so once data is de-identified, you always keep the identified data in a secure location, and that's where encryption comes in. So you need to make sure that you have the, the, the softwares to, to, to encrypt the data, and always keep Excel sheets with passwords before sharing. It's always important that you password Excel sheets before you share them. We've had many situations where lists of beneficiaries from monitoring data are shared with Excel, without any form of protection. And that is very dangerous um, for data protection. 
um, but with all these passwords comes, you know, quite also a lot of responsibilities. Using your names, your birth dates, your pet's name, all these names that people can, or passwords that people can attribute to your person is not secure. And so you need to always think twice about passwords and how you manage them. You could easily use a password manager, but then the one most important thing is not to forget the password to the password manager itself. And this can be helpful for your data collection and for the protection of your, of your data after data collection. So I think um, at this point, I would, um, I would come to a halt and then we would uh, move on to the next thing. We wanted to have, wanted to have one, um, one session or one short session for a feedback. Um, but before that, before that, we have um, a, a short breakout session, um, really short one, wouldn't take a lot of our time. And so I would just quickly ask Nathan to probably take over from here. Um, so um, we now come to the final breakout session. Um, it's going to be to do with um, ethical um, research. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Perfect, so you see it. Um, and I will just over. OK, so um, we're going to send you into the breakout sessions for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, it will be the final um, part of the breakout sessions. Um, and the situation, it's going to be a quick role play. So um, a little bit of background is that the um, the key part of ethical research and a basic requirement for any uh, IRB process is that we can take informed consent from any participant. Um, so in your group, you should develop a process for informed consent for a follow up one hour survey for participants of a migrant returnee program where we want to ask about employment and income. 